So one of the tests that we use on a daily basis to help us understand pop, dysautonomia, orthostatic intolerance, even concussions better is using a tilt test. And it's probably something you've heard of, but one thing that we do differently is we add a wrinkle to it that I think is really, really, really effective, especially for people that have dealt with some type of neurological injury along the way, whether that's a concussion, sports concussion, a car accident, something where we've, we've affected processing power in the brain and that has an effect on autonomic function. And I'll show you what I mean by that right here. In this image, you're looking at a spreadsheet that basically compiles data from a tilt test. And as we're looking at that, we're looking in this case, uh, importantly at the, the Doppler portion of the series. So the left middle cerebral artery and the right middle cerebral artery. And you can see the percentage of change that happens from laying down at baseline to when we tilt people up to 70 degrees. And then we measure that over the minutes that accrue during the test. But one thing that we do that is a little bit differently, as people are moving, we, so for example, in this case, you can see there's there's a little bit of a, a difference here in left to right. So we want these numbers to be bigger than 90% in the first minute and then bigger than 85% in the subsequent minutes. And on the left side, they all kind of fit that criteria. But then on the right side, we see this drop that happens in minute two, through four um, of that cerebral blood flow. So that's interesting. Then we see though, in this minute eight is really important because this minute eight, we do a slightly different portion of the test. So what we ask people to do is to dual task, but we have people count backwards from a number by another number. So whether that's counting backwards from 200 by sevens or by threes, but what we wanna see is we wanna see this element of dual tasking where they're using their brain to think about something consciously but we're not necessarily using sensory motor systems in the body. And this is really, really helpful because we can differentiate in this way between symptoms that are neurologically driven and ones that are mechanically driven. So for example, if someone's got uh, an occlusion of an artery in their neck that's preventing blood flow and that changes blood pressures in the body and in the brain, that's one type of problem. Then a different type of problem is if someone has these alterations where we see a change in the flow, but we maintain a blood pressure. But if we ask them to use their brain, we ask them to use those centers that help us do math in the brain. So these dual tasking areas, when we ask them to use that, in this case, you can see that acceleration of blood flow that's coming in. We can use that as a strategy and then that helps us to be able to retrace that. And we can look at eye movements and we can look at balance and we can look at motor and sensory you know, sensory inputs and motor outputs. And we can start to determine what is the culprit here. So this is one case where this is really helpful because you see in that eighth minute when we're dual tasking, all of a sudden we get this pump we get this increase in blood flow. And then when it's done and we go back to baseline, we see that number drop back down again. So this is really helpful for us to understand, even when people are orthostatic, maybe just laying there has one effect on the reflexogenic system, the reflexes of blood flow or hemodynamic. But on the other side, we can see when we actually use these neurovascular models, we use these neurovascular systems, are we able to change that blood supply purely based on the way that we use the brain? And that has a huge impact on how we treat them going forward to help them regain that function. So if you're somebody that's working through that, working through a diagnosis, hopefully now as you move through these videos, you're starting to see while having a diagnosis of POTS or orthostatic intolerance or dysautonomia kind of gets you an invitation to the party. Once you get there, you realize there's a whole lot of nuance patient to patient. And when we take a look at that and we understand it better, it gives us a better on ramp to deciding what do we do to help people out? How do we get them down the road so they can feel better? So I hope that helps. Leave us a comment, like it, share it, please. We really appreciate it. Thanks.